Welcome to another episode of OTA on the air with me today is Steve Bryan with a blue wire. So Steve, thanks for uh, joining us today. Absolutely. Tom, glad to be here. Well, I guess, tell us a little bit about uh, your history in the industry, where you got your start, uh, I guess, from a technology perspective and then, and then how you got involved in trucking. Sure. Yeah. I don't have near the history that a lot of your members do, Tom, but I'm I'm, uh, I've become very passionate about the trucking industry. I, I started a company called Vigilo uh, back in 2007, uh, June of 2007, and I, I had a vague notion that the trucking industry might have need for kind of moving the needle a little bit on data and on analytics. And uh, so we had been pointed towards the trucking industry by some advisors who said that might be an industry uh, that we could, uh, we could help in. Of course, we hadn't heard of CSA at the time, had no idea what that was. So uh, we, I think the timing was good. We came into, into an industry that was, uh, uh, you know, was starving for data uh, analytics on all fronts. And then along came the CSA program that of course is steeped in data and, a, and an overly complex methodology that was difficult to understand and explain. And so that's what Vigilo did and we, uh, did that very successfully for a decade. And in 2017, I sold that business uh, to another company called Samba Safety. They're a Denver-based private equity-backed company and uh, big in the MVR world. And we saw that as a very uh, compatible kind of a combination between monitoring drivers across their MVR records, which is both in and out of the truck. And then also uh, obviously the Vigilo business, uh, the monitoring the driver behavior and safety data through the CSA program. Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and on that, you know, obviously your, your background in, in data and, and CSA being as complex as it is provided you an opportunity to simplify that. But, you know, you've talked, in, you know, at our previous conventions and talked about what are, what are some things that you believe that the FMCSA could do to make that CSA process and the process of uh, defining good carriers and bad carriers better and easier to understand. Oh my gosh, Tom, how much time do we have again? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, look, I was a big fan. I mean, I was probably, look, you know, if you look under the hood of CSA, you can't help but be a critic. You know, there's a lot of problems with that methodology and the way they collect data and the amount of data and all that stuff. Uh, I actually was a big fan of what some of you may remember was uh, called item response theory or IRT. This was a a new proposed methodology that came out of the, uh, the National Academy's work um, associated with the FAST Act. It feels like ancient history now. That was 2015, and, and uh, Congress ordered through the FAST Act a, a study of CSA reform. And that, what came out of that about two years later was called item response theory. It was a new, a new statistical model for running CSA. And of course, we were we were now part of Samba Safety at the time, and we jumped into that, and 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 we built a model. We we built a model, and we thought it worked. We went and met with the FMCSA. We showed it to them, and even even today, we sit here today, rolling into 2022, and they still haven't adopted it. So you know, I mean, I don't want to speak for the FMCSA. They say the same thing. Ah, CSA works fine for us the way it is, and I think that ignores the the problematic nature of so many aspects of CSA and how it hurts carriers and it hurts them on the insurance front and with customers and with lawyers and today's landscape with these crazy verdicts, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I mean, my advice yeah. would be, hey, hey, FMCSA, go back and take a hard look at IRT. It works. Yeah, you know, then and that's the interesting part is, is that even though the Congressional Act that, that, that allowed CSA to exist says deep in there that you know it's not supposed to be used for insurance rating and it's not supposed right. to be used off that side we all know that public data especially government data is going to be used and and there again if you're in the insurance business or any other business you're going to rely on the data you have in front of you to say that if people aren't supposed to or aren't going to use it is just uh, is a pipe dream so yeah that's uh, right yeah well, so, especially especially in a dearth of data if you don't have you know I, i'm going to I don't want to come say that I'm sympathetic with the insurance industry. That would be that would be wrong. Um, 
but I do, I do, do feel for them, right? They're trying to rate risk in an enormous, unbelievably diverse industry uh, with billions of moving parts, and they just don't have good data. So when something like CSA presents itself, you can't blame them really for saying, oh, look, a, a way that I might do my job better. We'd all look at that data, right? So they don't care much about the disclaimer at the bottom of the SMS website saying, don't use this for those purposes. It's not, it doesn't go very far. Well, so you made reference to this about uh, trial lawyers getting a hold of this information. Let's talk a little bit about trial lawyers and nuclear verdicts and, and the impact it has uh, on the industry. And, and I guess talk to us a little bit about what you see as is the, the prevailing thoughts on, on how these nuclear verdicts will impact the industry and, and really how we kind of got here. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, so I mean, all of us know have been looking at this problem. This isn't something that just happened, right? These so-called nuclear verdicts have been on the rise now for, for a decade. You know, you look at studies done recently by groups like Atri that I think do a great job and, and they'll, they'll tell you these things have been around for you know, a decade, 12 years, but they've spiked, unbelievably spiked just in the last couple of years, since about 2017, 18, you know, this is just, it's gotten out of control. So what's happened is these plaintiff firms, the trial lawyers, have developed a theory, they call it the reptile theory, and it's used outside of trucking too. It's not just a trucking theory, but it's basically very simple. Um, it uses the, the human uh, predisposition to respond to fear and anger. And so they inflame these juries. Uh, it's, it's what they call the old brain or the triune brain. It's the reptile brain that we have from that we has evolved since we crawled out of the swamps, um, and it it only cares about about preserving itself and and, uh, and and fighting back. It's a very very simple brain that we have, and now we have this smarter neocortex on top of that that presumably thinks. I uh, wonder about that sometimes. But so these these trial lawyers have developed this very. It's really a very simple theory attack the reputation of the motor carrier, make them look like bad corporate citizens that don't care about your safety or your family or highways or any of that stuff. They just don't care, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. And the only way you're going to wake them up is to punish them by hitting them with a huge verdict. It's very simple. That's what they do. And so they've gotten brilliant at it. They have conferences and they have white papers and they have training class. You can, you can get certified in how to sue a trucking company. It's just crazy. So, and then more recently, the, the private equity folks have, have uh, noticed this. And so now there's litigation finance. So there are private equity firms around the country that might invest in any business who are now looking at lawsuits as an investment opportunity. So they're putting tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars into funds that they then go out looking for these cases and fund the plaintiff's firms to attack this industry. So we're, we're, we've got a big challenge on our hands, Tom. It's a big battle that we're in. It's not gonna be an easy one to win. Yeah, I think that was the part when, when I really got, got triggered, if you will, about when hedge funds started investing in court cases mm -hmm. that you knew it wasn't about the victim. It wasn't about the victims of these accidents and making sure that they, are righted or that they are provided with a, with a compensation to offset, you know, their future medical bills or whatever else it became a profit center uh, and a that's huge right. profit center at that point. That's right. And that's wrong on so many different levels. So well, I guess right. I, I agree with you. And they've got, they've got uh, medical experts that they've now brought in There are for, you know, basically pay doctors to say whatever you want them to say and the medical experts, they pay them a lot of money. Uh, to inflate the value of injuries. Um, and, and then, you know, they've got other experts. They'll have everything from accident reconstructionists to psychologists to counselors and all kinds of things. All of them lined up in front of the jury trying to convince the jury that this motor carrier in this case just doesn't care about you and you should punish them. And they do. They reach into the purse and in most, you know, notwithstanding some recent successes, which are awesome in some of the states, Texas and a few others, the tort reform, which is badly needed, but most states aren't there and won't be there for a long time that limit those, the, the depth of those purses. And that's, uh, that's what we're, you know, you get people, there's a term out there, they call it social inflation, right? We have jurors sitting in a jury box 
who look at sports figures and Hollywood stars and all kinds of things. And money glaze, just glazes over these days. I mean, you hear about uh, you know, the billionaires in the world and, and, and the trillions that companies are making. You just We get numb to dollars. So when the sympathy kicks in and the fear kicks in from this old brain, it's nothing to reach into a purse and say, let's give this guy a hundred million bucks. What's that? You know, that's, that's a big part of the problem. Yeah. You know, and for our, for our listeners, the, you know, the, the Texas one was a law that was passed that, that, that said you had to separate out the cases, you know, in two different parts um, where you had to, to prove one before you could go on to the, to the, the, the damages part of it. And, you know, we in Ohio already have that. And, and that's something that Ohio has been, very fortunate when it comes to tort reform is we've got a pretty good set of laws and, 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 and prior court cases to rely on that helps us out with that. And there's always room to grow, but you know, the, the, the pieces that we have in there um, are already in place here, here in Ohio. So, yeah. so Steve, I guess, uh, go ahead. Another, another point, sorry to cut you off there, Tom, just another point, but the, I think we, we all should watch, I think it's next week, maybe the group called ATRA, not ATRI, American Tort Reform Association, publishes every year what they call the judicial hell holes. So notwithstanding, maybe Ohio's doing a good job. Now maybe Texas is in that category. There's, these plaintiffs know where to go and they have incredible uh, skill dragging these cases into the venues that they want them to be in. It doesn't have to have anything to do with where the crash was. It may not even be the same state. It could be where they're domiciled. It could be where they hire drivers. It could be where their customers are. And they're very good at dragging these into the cases that are not Ohio and not Texas and getting them into sympathetic venues that uh, uh, just are one more piece of the piece of the puzzle. So, yeah, you know, and, and, and they will do that as part of their pretrial uh, due diligence is, is the venue shop to see where they can get it in there, where, you know, what which cases and which states would be able to be able to do that. No, no different than we did with uh, with the, you know, the, the Biden vax mandate. Is trying to find a sympathetic court to take it, and and yeah. you know, so I think everybody does that, but they're very good at it, and they understand it very well. And it's yeah. not always. I mean, there again, when you talk about judicial hellholes, you know, obviously uh, Illinois and, and and California come to mind right away. But I think some of those, some of the venues would surprise you. Florida being one of them. Um, you know, there's a lot of venues out there, and, and you can you can always tell the friendly venues with the number of billboards uh, by trial lawyers. I think right. it's probably. That, that's a study we should do for fun is, is to count the number of billboards that, that says sue big trucks and the and this and the correlation with it with the judicial hell holes i bet you very oh, pretty I, pretty close correlation oh that'd be a quick study Tom. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well i guess talk us a little bit now through um you know you, we talked a little bit about your background with technology with data with you know with that side of the house and then we talked about the um you know, the, the nuclear verdicts and the impact that that has on the industry, I guess, marry those two together for us to talk about what Blue Wire is doing. Yeah. So, so I started, I really started thinking about this in earnest, I'd say really focusing on it. And I was inspired by um, our, our leader, the industry leader, Chris Spear, uh, gave a, he gave comments at the closing session at the their annual meeting in 2019. It was in San Diego that year. Many of us were there and he got up there and he pounded the podium and he said, this is it. This is the year, meaning 2020, the year ahead, where we are gonna fight back as an industry against these nuclear verdicts. It's time we took the battle to them and we're gonna fight back. Well, unfortunately, none of us knew about this thing called COVID that was right around the corner. Right. And I, I think we got a little a little distracted as, as well, as a, as a world, as a, <laughs> you know, everybody did, but certainly as an industry. But I, that's when I really started thinking about what could you do with data? I wonder if you could do something with data, with all the latest, I mean, there's just incredible advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning. You hear these terms thrown around out in the data world. And it's really incredible the, where the science, the state of the science of data has come just in the last few years. So I started wondering, whether a, a service, a company could be built that might help. And that was where this started. It was a germ of an idea. So I didn't do much with it. I was still working at Samba Safety at the time. And, and until I left in August of 20, uh, really, and that was driven by COVID. I, I actually liked working there. I was going to Denver every week, most weeks, and liked Denver and back and forth between Denver and Portland. That's a pretty good gig. But um, 
you know, COVID put a stop to my trips out to Denver. I started feeling a little bit disconnected from the company. So I decided to move off and do something else. And that's when I really focused in on this issue and started researching, did a lot of reading, a lot of, I start, started talking to people. I called every one of my past customers, mentors, competitors, and friends throughout the industry, just bouncing ideas off of them. And that, that grew to become the, the concept that we've now launched just, in, just since May. I mean, we, we didn't even really announce ourselves till uh, it was in the ATA mid-year meeting in San Antonio in May. So it's barely six months ago. Um, what's two days ago it was the 15th of May so uh, just past our six month uh, anniversary if you will so uh, we've raised some money on the concept we've built the company we've got up we've got 12 employees now and we are looking to launch a product uh, Q1 of next year and that will be a platform offered to motor carriers to subscribe to where we will gather data from all of the platforms that the trial lawyers claim they don't do a good job with. So we are gonna be tapped into everything from job boards, social media, uh, pre-hire, uh, driver qualification file systems, uh, ELDs, hours of service, cameras. I mean, think about, think about all the suppliers in this industry that do all this amazing work. Those are all the systems we will begin to monitor, audit, if you will, electronically on an ongoing continuous basis and when we find vulnerabilities, uh, we will direct the customer to the solution. It's those vulnerabilities, uh, we call them attack vectors. It's a term that comes from cybersecurity where an attack vector might be a malware attached to an email or something like that. So in our world, an attack vector would be something like you have an inordinate number of hours of service violations, you're not acting on them. Uh, an attack vector might be you don't keep good uh, EQ files and you need to. Uh, an attack vector might be, why don't you use cameras? You know, those types of things. These are the things we see in the court documents that they use to start to have these jurors ponder, yeah, why, why aren't these guys doing a good job here? So that's what our software will do. It will mine the data across all these different systems. We'll find vulnerabilities. Tom, I think of us like a, it's like we're a physician, right? We have the blood pressure cuff and the O2 meter on your fingertip, and we're monitoring for your general health in these different areas. Uh, and then when we find that you probably need a, you need a little bit of a, a tune up in a certain area, then we send you, we connect you to these industry partners who can help you catch that up ahead of the crash. That's the key, the key uh, message we like to give is look, we're not a, we're not a post crash response service. We are a pre crash preparation service. Get yourself ready. And when the inevitable happens, uh, you will be prepared to do a better job in depositions, in trial, and all the way along this process, because you will have your, your positive and truthful, actual narrative about your company well lined up so that when they attack you in these depositions, we, we have a thought experiment that you're, you're sitting in a deposition against one of these, these reptile trained uh, trial lawyers, and they start picking you apart. Uh, our thought experiment is that you respond by saying, counselor, I'm so glad you asked that question. And then you tell your story. And that's what we're not doing a very good job of today. We're simply responsive. We're too defensive. And, and just because we're on the defense doesn't mean we have to be defensive. We can be very positive about our, our industry and our individual companies because they are incredible. We do an amazing job. So is this uh, system the kind of piece that would, would delve down into or dig down into email exchanges, reports that are filled out by the company and their, and their like terminal managers or their staff? And then, and then what is the, about you know, implications from social media? Yeah. yeah, so the answer is yes, to a certain extent. We're not going to monitor every email that takes place in the company. We're not going not gonna to do that. But there are some areas we've seen, again, we're we, we study these court cases and we're looking to see where do they have success in court. So you get into things like email conversations. And yes, those things absolutely get brought up in depositions. And sometimes those can be damaging uh, to your case. Uh, we see the, the, the lower hanging fruit is, is areas like, uh, well, you mentioned social media. I'll come back to that one. One of the areas we're looking at is the, the, the chatter that takes place between the dispatcher and the driver. You know, picture the PowerPoint in trial with the, with the statement from a dispatcher that says something like, I don't care how many hours you've got left, you get that load delivered. 
You know, that's not what you want to see on a PowerPoint in trial. So we do monitor systems like that. Again, it's more about monitoring the systems, but we are getting deep into what's called text mining. So that's where we are. We are able to discern from human language, from tech, from written and verbal and, and even video language where issues arise. And that's where we're, we turn our attention to things like social media. So we are, we are building the systems to look at, you know, if, if XYZ trucking uh, and we start querying all the big social media platforms and we find that there's a lot of bad stuff being said about this company, that's an attack vector. That's something the plaintiffs will bring up and say, well, why is it that you got these, these past drivers that are so critical of you and say that you never cared about them and didn't care there about their hours or their safety, you know, that kind of thing. So we will definitely be looking for that kind of language. And how do you fix that? You need to start to tune that up. There's all companies do this. There's, there's whole PR firms that specialize in helping companies do a better job of, of tuning up their social media uh, presence. And we need to do that in this industry. We don't do near enough of it. We just let it happen to us. And we need to stop that. So that's a, that's a big one, social media. So let me let me ask you this to, to make sure that I understand this correctly. So if a dispatcher is having a telephone conversation with a driver, and you are actually able to discern that voice down to weed out those using AI to weed out those conversations. And that, and that absolutely yeah, Tom, that absolutely is possible. Right now, early days, we're not into the telephone conversations, we're into that. The, the messaging services, the data services that exist from the, the TMS providers um, and, the, and the telematics in the cab. So, but could we? Absolutely. If we could get into those telephone conversations, probably down the road, we'll find that there's a need for that. Um, but right now, the lower hanging fruit is in the, the messaging services that they're using in cab that are built to do exactly that. They're built to communicate with the driver. So one of the arguments that we always heard and, uh, about hair testing, let's say, is, you know, with that now, you know, potentially being an acceptable form of, of testing, but a trucking company is only using like your analysis in order to do their testing. And it comes up in court, well, why didn't you use drug test or why didn't you use hair testing? And somebody says, well, it's too expensive. And then, then, then that boils off into, into other pieces. Yeah. I guess, what has been the thought about you're now collecting all these data points and, and logging them somewhere? You know, what, what is your counter argument to say, hey, this, is, this digs way too deep in, in the, into my world that by having that data, it'll hurt my case rather than help my case? Yeah, right? we hear that every day. Um, and the answer is we already have the data. We're not creating anything. We're not creating new data that puts you at higher risk. That data is already there. It's already discoverable and it can be found in any case. All they have to do is ask for it. So, you know, my answer to that would be better you know about it up front and prepare yourselves than get surprised when they start digging down into these systems, which they can do without blue wire. They don't need us to access your hours of service data or your drug and alcohol screens or any of that other stuff. They can discover all of it. So talk a little bit about what the user experience looks like. Is this something that the executive gets a monthly report on with, uh, you know, hey, here are three key areas that you need to take action on. I guess, how does, what's that user experience from, from the company standpoint look like uh, coming from this system to help them correct some, some bad behaviors? Yeah, now you're getting into the fun part. If, if we were doing this next week, I'd show you <laughs> where <laughs> We're in, uh, you know, we're kind of in our final design phase of what that user experience looks like. What does it look like for the customer? The customer is someone at the motor carrier who is tasked with uh, monitoring this this relationship, right? We are essentially evaluate or you know this reputation, not relationship. The reputation of the carrier is at the end of the day what we are evaluating. So whether it's safety or risk or even the owner or somebody the owner retains there, it could be their insurance company, it could be their defense attorney. Somebody is going to be there interested in monitoring the, the progress they're making towards closing those vulnerabilities. So we do have uh, what I think people are gonna find is a gorgeous and very informative dashboard, very action oriented. Um, if, if, uh, if you had the uh, opportunity over the years to engage with Vigilo, we had the same philosophy. 
You want to be able to hold it up across the room and look at it and go, ah, I see what I have to do. I know what I have to do. So the, you know, we're, we're not going to get deep down into doing predictive analytics on specific drivers. And there's companies out there that do a lot of that kind of thing. We are going to be the, the bright big dashboard, very clear that says, I've got a vulnerability over there. I need to go close that up. Oh, and I see exactly how I need to do that. So it's uh, very visual, uh, very uh, modern UI. We're using all the latest uh, techniques and I think people are gonna find it a really great experience. And, and almost no work for the customer to do. All the wiring in the back end and the hooking up to the data and the compiling of scores, we do all of that. All of that is done in the background. You'll simply have to look at the dashboards, the reports, and take action on where it is we're steering. So we're, we're excited about it. That's good. So, um, you know, you obviously bring a bring a wealth of knowledge from the industry's perspective and from the technology perspective, but, you know, you had built out a pretty robust advisory group and, and partners that you work with, I guess, talk us a little bit through, you know, like one of them that comes to mind is, is Karen Rasmussen, who's been, you know, an icon in this industry for years, um, I guess, kind of talk to us a little bit about that team that you have around you uh, that is in the process of developing this. Yeah. Um, so, I think of it as kind of, we, we've, we've come to call this our army of allies, Tom. That's a term we use because we started this by, you know, I said, look, this is not software where you click the button and this solves your nuclear verdict problem. That's not what this is. That's not even reasonable. What we need to do is form up people who have vast experience across this industry in all kinds of different areas and form this army so that we can fight back. Look, the plaintiffs have an army. They have their billboard guys, they have their trial lawyers, they have their medical experts, et cetera. We need that. We need, we need this industry to align behind a movement and all of this fight this together. That's the only way we're going to win. So in, as I thought about this, I thought, you know, and, and Tom, my, my uh, approach at Vigilo was very different. I, I founded that company. I funded that company. Uh, I owned that company. You know, we had employees that owned shares by the end of it, but we never had any investors. I never had a board of directors. I didn't have a boss. Uh, we could not be doing it more differently now with Blue Water. So uh, I recruited an incredible board of directors who are now my boss. The answer to them, uh, they are a rock star group. And I won't, I won't even try to go through and name all the names, but uh, you know, uh, incredible depth and breadth of talent in our board. And then we said, you know, let's get, let's put together what we call our advisory board. And our advisory board is more tactical. It's more, hey, let me call and talk to this person about what they think of this concept or that thing. What do you think of this idea? What about this approach? Uh, we wanted some people we could go to less formal than a board of directors, and that's our advisory board. And uh, one of the first people I thought of was Karen. So you know, I met Karen back when she was the executive at the Arizona Trucking Association and, and had the opportunity to speak to her group a few times over the years. And then, you know, um, got to be very good friends with Karen. I just think she's a rock star. So, you know, we've, we, if you look at the advisory board on our website, it runs all the way from uh, very experienced trucking operators, people like Karen at the state trucking associations, We've got people who are psychologists working in, uh, in deposition coaching, uh, you know, in preparation for trial. And we even have a very famous truck driver. I just thought, I was always frustrated at Vigilo that all the talking we did around the FMCSA and every committee and working group and everything you can imagine, they never had a truck driver sitting in the room. And I always thought that was crazy. So uh, we have John Lex, who some of you may know, just an awesome guy. So he's on our advisory board. And and uh, that, that we think is, is just really helping us a lot. And then finally, the company, I won't go through everybody, but uh, Blue Wire actually has four founders. I'm one of them. Uh, Bob Boyich uh, has a, a whole career, 40 years in the private fleet side in driver staffing. Uh, many of you know Doug Marcello, who's a 30-some-odd uh, year experienced defense attorney in the trucking industry. And then uh, uh, Peter Rowe, who is our chief technology officer, he was the architect of Vigilo, and he is now the architect of Blue Wire. So that's the four founders we all share in, the, in that role, and uh, uh, just a great group, a great team. 
all around. And we continue to build it and we'll continue to build it. We have an investor group uh, that's another bit of a more silent group. We don't publicize who they are, but we have been raising money through the summer to get us up to where we can hire people. And uh, again, if you if you knew the names of those people, you just it's the who's who of the trucking industry. They're not private equity. They're not venture capitalists. They're people from the industry passionate about this that said, how can I help? So that's our investor group. So uh, I could talk about them all day long. I'm very proud of, that, of all of them. Good. So you have also... Um with me in, in, in Vegas at the TCA convention, got the opportunity to go to the Nevada Trucking Association meeting and, and, and hear Dr. Bill Kanaski, who's been a guest on this show. So you've actually are in the process now of working with him to provide online training or provide you know exactly. what has been dubbed the mongoose method on an online basis. I guess, talk a little bit about the plans to better educate the industry um, as to how to fight the reptile theory uh, and, and the, uh, the nuclear verdicts. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. So um, I heard about this. So we, we met, I met Bill Kanaski earlier this year. He was uh, referred to me by somebody who said, this is, a, this is a guy that really knows this stuff. You gotta meet him. So we did, he's now on our advisory board. Um, uh, just a great, great guy, I love Bill. Uh, very knowledgeable. So uh, I think he, he, we, Blue Wire and Bill, and Paul Enos, your colleague with uh, Nevada Trucking, were all in attendance at the ATA General Counsel Forum in Washington, D.C. in July of this past summer. And, and uh, a conversation was had uh, between Paul and, and Mr. Kanaski to go put together what they called the anti-reptile training. So this would be a classroom training that Bill would travel around the country and gather people and stand up in front of a room for you know, six, eight hours, whatever the case may be, and train people at the trucking company, those that will be called upon to be deposed. Um, well, I'll tell you, Tom, you can go on YouTube and look for uh, trucking defense depositions. And it's, it's, it's quite frankly embarrassing. Um, we send people in for these depositions that are not well prepared. So, so Paul and Bill decided to to attempt to remedy this by putting together this anti-reptile training. And I heard about it and I said, well, guys, this is, that's great. I love the idea, but doing it one stand-up classroom at a time is gonna take a long, it's like tort reform, right? We'll be at this for the rest of our lives. Why don't we do a computer-based training, an online course that can be hugely leveraged? Now everybody can come in and take it and we can make it available to the world. And guess what? Uh, I and some of the team at Blue Wire have spent a decade in educational software. We know how to do this. So let us put that together and we'll form a three-way alliance here, a partnership, and we'll go to market with this anti-reptile training, which then later was dubbed the mongoose method. The mongoose, I love that. The mongoose obviously being the, the thing that attacks reptiles. Uh, so we're working on that partnership. We're working on developing that training, and we hope to have the first of those courses out early next year. And and that'll be one more arrow in our quiver uh, to help fight this battle. Yeah, that's great. I remember uh, testifying as an expert witness in a case, and and uh, for the prosecutor for the defense, and then and literally we were walking in the courtroom. And the defense attorney looked at me, and goes, "Hey, you good? You, you got you got any worries about testifying?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" He says, and and I kind of wondered why. And he, he's like, "Well, we haven't had a chance to like even talk before I put you on the stand." I'm like probably a downfall that that's how we go yeah. into depositions they just like throw you in there and hope yeah, you're gonna be okay a, right and it's not it's a good amazing. That, not a good story there Tom. Yeah. not a good story so we won that's that's the good part so i guess uh, i guess let's close out with why blue wire the name ah uh very simple um it, every every action movie ever made tom i'll, I'll say every one ever made the hero uh, at the very end, in the closing seconds, in order to defuse the nuclear bomb, cuts the blue wire. So that was where, that's as simple as that. Go watch, I think it's uh, Lethal Weapon number two uh, is the best example of that, of what happens if you actually cut the wrong wire. So that's where the name came from. Right. Well, good. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for being with us today and, and, and educating us a little bit about what you're doing and, and the work that you're doing to help, uh, help the industry uh, educate itself and protect itself from from these nuclear verdicts and 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 we always appreciate having you uh 
as part of this industry and the energy that you bring. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for the work you do. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity. Anytime.